Welcome to the Soulful CXO. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Wynn. We are pleased to have back with us, Michelle Stewart. Hi. Michelle is JAG Investigation CEO with over 34 years of investigation experience. Her expertise lies in open source intelligence, OSINT, counterintelligence, insurance fraud investigations, financial investigations, threat assessments and mitigations, due diligence, organized retail crime, and corporate and competitive intelligence. She provides consulting and training services to federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, military intelligence communities, Fortune 500 companies, and the financial and industries of insurance. Additionally, she has served as an instructor at Quantico, the FBI Academy, for international training in OSINT, is a keynote speaker and teaches classes for many professional organizations, which is where she and I first met well over 13 years ago. I took one of her classes then. In 2017, Michelle's dedication to the field led her to collaborate with the Pennsylvania Office of Homeland Security. Together, they developed a groundbreaking Keeping Kids Safe program, which educates administrators, principals, teachers, parents, and others on the risk associated with online and social media activity predator grooming, as well as dangers of application cellular security. Michelle, it's such a delight to have you back on the show with us today. Thanks. So you asked me to get straight into it after I had to give that great bio about you. <laughs> We've recently seen in the news, especially here in Arizona, about autonomous cars, about all the lawsuits that are against them, about them driving into lakes, running into vehicles, crossing traffic and things along those lines. It seems to me like a malicious attacker could probably maybe take over those cars and cause real hectics for everybody. But what, what do you see along those fields? What are your thoughts? It's a lot of the software, the AI that's being utilized in these smart cars, smart devices and everything. I don't necessarily always think it's a malicious type of attack. I think it's a learning thing that the program, the software has to do in and of itself still. But I'm sure that you guys have seen videos of the cars they're driving, unfortunately, the wrong way. I know that I just saw one last week where a Waymo car just was coming head on, on you know, going the completely wrong direction that it was supposed to. Or in Austin, I don't know if you saw that one. That would actually make me laugh. There was a whole bunch of those cars all stuck together, and they caused this huge traffic jam because none of them would move because there was two of them that were facing each other. Neither one would move, and so now it just created this huge coordinated or uncoordinated um, traffic jam. And it was just, it's funny to watch the videos, but it's scary in that same sense because you don't have control of the vehicle, right? It's the software that's supposed to be going through its guidelines. But the one that I saw recently also was, it was a Tesla and it didn't read the flood zone sign and it just drove right into the waters and put the individual right into, took them off the road and drove them right into the water. And so I think that, and I've been trying to watch and, and study these and watch some videos on uh, the explanation of why things are happening. And it's more of a software system where they're saying that, especially on Tesla, there was one where it, it wanted to go back on the right side of the road, but that side of the road had construction on it. And so the driver kept pulling it back to the left side. So it's trying to do what it's supposed to do, but it just doesn't realize the atmosphere that it's in, right? The environment that it's in and it needs to stay on the left side of the road. I think that this is going to be something continually that's going to happen just because things change. It's fluctuating environments that these vehicles have to go through. I personally, I won't do them. I won't ride in one. I want to have control. Maybe it's because I'm a control freak. I don't know. But I want to control my vehicles. I've never been inside one of them. And I know some people that really enjoy them, but I still like to have the feel of the wheel right below my hands. Yeah, I think there's another story here, actually, in Arizona. I think it was downtown Phoenix, where there was like a landscaper's truck that had trees in the back. And no, I think it was a Waymo car went behind them and then kept thinking it was about to go into trees. So it kept stopping in the middle of rush hour traffic because it thought that there was a real tree instead of it was a tree on top of a truck, which I thought was pretty funny because it because they would finally move and the car would move and then it would stop because it was tree. I'm glad safety first. But I thought it was interesting for people who are trying to get through rush hour. Who's oh my god, please truck well, move out see, of the way. 
the other thing that I had to laugh about, I actually just saw it a couple days ago. Um, people were taking cones, the traffic cones, and putting it on the hood of a Waymo because it would just stop it. It freezes them because it doesn't, it thinks it's in a, an area it's not supposed to be. So they were doing these, this is all across town. They were taking these construction cones and putting them on these cars and just freezing them all over the place. And they were taking videos of it and putting it online. And I was like, oh my gosh, I thought it was funny. It's not funny for them, but it, it is funny. It almost seems like a Halloween or April Fool's Day kind of joke. Not an all time thing, but yeah, that'd be cute to see. But I we know. are seeing AI get more and more in cars, in tires and things along those lines. Mm-hmm. It seems like what can be used for good could be used for evil. Have you seen anything oh. along those lines about some of the, the other AI components that are coming into cars for even our personal cars? There's, and I don't know if you've heard it or the listeners have heard of it. I just actually sat through some training on this, on smart tires. And there's a couple different components on smart tires, not only the affiliation of the um, application that's going to give pressure gauge um, information, uh, you know, the, the tread on the, the tire, but actually now it has geolocational information. So now it's usually within the, um, the valve, and I hope I'm saying this right because I'm not really mechanically this person, but that's where the um, the chip is going to be located. And so there was a, a case where a high-end vehicle had all that star- uh, their tires stolen, and they actually were able to track the tires down because of geolocational information within the, the smart tires. So everything, it's just wild that we have so many capabilities and so many things that can be utilized with AI, which I have always said, I think technology is a beautiful thing, but I also think it can be a very dangerous thing. And that's It's not just cars. We have it now in our medical fields. We have it in our financial institutions. We have it in our learning capabilities. And so AI is going everywhere. And I just, everybody has their own opinion on it. I think it's moving pretty fast. And I like it. I've utilized it. I've utilized it in my presentations. I've utilized it to create um, outlines and training uh, products for me and material. But in that same sense, I'm very weary of it also because I see the negative aspects that can happen by people utilizing it wrong. We've all heard deep fakes. We've all heard that. Um, But there's so much more involved than just deep fakes when it comes into some of this AI stuff. Can you explain a little bit more about what is going on, not only by deep fakes, but we have the music industry. We we end up having whose voice is being used for what, and is it okay to use it? Can you clone a voice? Can you not clone a voice? Things along those lines. Can you explain a little bit more about what's going on on that and oh, why yes. people should be paying attention? Yeah, a couple things I could bring in. I've had to work some of these cases already where somebody calls somebody, and I know you've heard this. It's been all over the news. Um, and in the background, you can hear that person's voice, like, Daddy, you know, help me, Daddy, um, or Mom. They're, they've kidnapped me. They're going to kill me if we don't pay the money. And the person isn't there, obviously. And I actually had this happen to somebody that I know where her father received a call and saying that the Mexican cartels had his daughter. And unless he paid a certain amount of money, that they were either going to rape her or kill her or whatever they said to him. And he didn't realize that it was fake. Thankfully, he called his wife and she said, she's standing right here. But the voice in the background was definitely his daughter. And so we have these really bad things that can happen now with technology and with the AI type of systems. But not only like that, now we also have these things called generators. I talked about this in my class. And the thing about generators, which makes things scary for me in that sense, is they look so real. And so I can make it look like two people were talking over Instagram, right? Over Facebook, in their DMs, in Twitter. Um, I can make a fake text message and make it look like I got a screenshot from you and it was you discussing something inappropriate about work or something racial. Um, And then it can make it look like somebody saying something proprietorial. And so now these generators, when you're looking at them, and I've seen them, 
they look real. It looks like a true text message between two individuals. Or I can make it look like a text message between you and I, right? But I'm the person who's in there typing everything. I'm typing my response to you, but I'm typing your response to me. Now I could ruin your job in seconds, really, and take these screenshots and go to you know, your HR and how many people in HR or even in security know about these generators. And they're very easy to find. Unfortunately, Google it. There's a generator for everything. So now we have to look at not only the deep fakes of creating these videos of people saying things that they're not saying, but now we have this ability through AI again to create these communications that didn't happen on numerous platforms. And so those are the things that kind of get me because as an investigator, as somebody who obviously, when it comes into trying to protect the public, um, it's getting difficult. You have to make sure that you have a second or third piece of evidential material that's going to back up what we're seeing originally. But then look at it this way too, Rebecca. And this is the one that as a mom makes my heart hurt is the ability that is out there now for cyberbullying. And, and then we're not even talking about the on, making it anonymous and how they're creating these fake Twitter accounts, but now they can create this whole fake conversation that never existed. And then all of a sudden they put that out there and now it is a whole new realm of cyberbullying. And so these kids can't just come out and say, I never said that because it looks like they did. It's a dangerous game. There's so many different things that AI can assist that is a good ethical way but so many bad things too can come from it. Yeah, we're seeing that a lot in a lot of the recent court cases that have been televised because people are like, I took a screen capture and I took that screen capture and I made a PDF and that's what I handed over to some law person or investigator. And I'm always like, where's the date and time? Where's yeah. the metadata that, that proves that you didn't go in and alter it? Because you can always delete a, a part of that chat. Oh, right. Yeah. What is the sentences before or after? Or if you have an image, you can totally go ahead and falsify the time and date and do an image and make a PDF. You don't know it's from that person. And then even if it was from that phone, how do you know that someone else didn't have access to my phone, either oh, yeah. direct or indirect through maybe a software to do that? And so I tell people it's really easy for people to put that up on social media but it acts as like, does it sound like the, and even before you say, does it sound like the person, does it seem like that they would do that? We're in the area, but now with AI, my writing's out there, your writing's out there, make it sound like person yeah. X and the way that they speak. And so it can really falsify. So I think that's one thing that really people have to pause. You have to give the person way more than we used to the benefit yeah. of the doubt. We were always supposed to give them the benefit of the doubt. We didn't always do that. I'll be guilty of that. But now oh, you I really agree. have to go ahead and give the benefit of the doubt because you should assume it's falsified first, in my opinion. But here's the thing too, is we can say that. And I think most of the people who listen to your podcast also has maybe a technical background and understand that. But a really a high percentage of people don't understand this. They don't know that it's out there. And maybe they've heard of it. It's not that I'm saying that nobody's ever heard of AI. Everybody's heard of AI. But how it actually can be utilized and how easy it is to be utilized. One of my examples that I do in my class is I created this fake TikTok capture. And I took a photograph that was years and years old and not even from our country. And I created it and I asked my class, how many people do you think this is real? This, and I made it into kind of a violent situation. And almost more than half of my class raised their hand. Not one people, not one person said, did anybody right click on the photograph and do an image recognition or a facial recognition? Which if they had, that's the very first thing I would have done is I would have right clicked or cut it out, whatever I could do, right? and done an image recognition, you would have immediately pulled it that it was a 10-year-old photograph out of another country that had made the news, right? But most people don't do that. They look at it, they see it, they believe it, and they forward it, they comment on it, right? And now this one thing that took me seconds to do has created its own life, and it's out there everywhere. 
I think it's really important that we have more education on this for people, especially within work environments. Um, because I've been called in now on a couple of different things where somebody has been accused of saying something that they never did. And by asking a couple very specific questions, um, and especially on a text to text, I was able to show that, that situation never occurred, that what they were looking at was a generated communication, right? So I think that it's going to take education, not only into work environments, but into school environments. Because think of that, again, not only the cyberbullying, but we have the bomb threats and make it look like somebody else did it. It's going it, to, that's what I said, I love technology, but in that same sense, I also don't like it because of the dangers behind it. I'm hoping that what we've been seeing a little bit of trend where news agencies are trying validating if there was artificial intelligence that were in play or if yeah. someone's posted something as a news saying, hey, here's the picture of this wreck or something along those lines. You're mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, this picture's from two years ago. This is from five years ago. I sliced and diced it and we're going to make the stop. I'm hoping that comes into play a lot more going forward. I think that'll help. But it's too easy for anybody now to throw information out there and make people believe it. And part of it was good journalism. I saw it, but did I go ahead and get it verified versus five people just picked it up in the newswire? And because it was in five different newswires, I'm going to assume it's the truth. Oh my gosh, just wait. Look at how propaganda is being used, AI is being used in war, right? In countries that are having issues. Just wait until elections come here in the United States on both sides. And it's going to be so filled with propaganda, this, this fake information, these fake videos, these fake um, people saying things that they're not saying. It's, it's going to be really difficult for people in just general to understand what is real and what isn't. And that's sad. It really is. I just, I wish we could go back to the good old days sometimes. Most definitely. And I wanted to touch back a little bit when we were talking about deep fakes. Could we talk a little bit about voice and things go along those lines? And then we also see the CEOs and CIOs and, and CFOs and people like that go ahead yeah. and their voice is cloned. I've also recently been consulting with people where they allow AI just to translate their voice into Japanese, another language. Yeah. I saw that and went, by the way, that is not the translation. And you guys should literally just put it out on LinkedIn and different places like that. I'm just telling you, if I was you, I would pull it down, but I wanted to bring it to your attention. What do you think about things like that as, especially when at times like you and I both had to validate, both of us have had to save people's job because they've falsely accused. Yeah. It's not only biometrics, it's the facial recognition. And then there's a lot also in people making fake AIs. I just recently went through a test myself. It was a hundred different images of quote unquote people. And the whole thing was, is which one was a real person and which one was the AI? I had one of the highest scores on picking up AI, but I would tell you, it, it was not high. Yeah. What do you well, see along right, those so lines I'm and sorry, concerning? I'm to talk over you. Yeah. There's a site that I would tell you and anybody who's listening to go to. It's called whichfaceisreal.com, whichfaceisreal.com. And it gives you two photographs, right? One's an AI-derived photograph, and then one is a real image. and it's. I always told everybody, um, I love the site. I'm on it all the time. When I'm on hold or I'm on a Zoom that I don't really care about, I'm on this, right? And I'm always playing it. And the reason is because you teach your brain. It's like when you learn how to shoot a gun, it becomes muscle memory. When you learn how to swing a baseball bat, when you learn how to throw a football, right? Um, everything becomes muscle memory. And it's with our brain. We have to teach it what to look for. And there are little indicators. But as, as AI keeps developing and developing, obviously, they're catching on to these things. But the thing that I always talk about when it comes into trying to recognize an AI photograph to determine if it's real or not, one of the best things that you're the first things that you should look at, not the best because it depends on the photograph, but one of the first things that I always tell everybody is look at people's earlobes. Look at the photograph's earlobe. Because if you have an earlobe that goes up genetically, your other side of your earlobe should go up before it touches your face, right? But sometimes in these generated photos, you'll see one that goes up and then one that ties into the face. 
Not that, that can't happen because I just had a gentleman who came up in my class and said, I'm a mutation. I'm like, what? And he's like, look at my ears. And sure enough, he had one that tied up and then tied down into his face. But normally, those earlobes are going to look the same, right? And second thing, for women especially, is always look at their earrings. AI has a very hard time matching earrings. Those two. Those two indicators are one of the things that I always train my classes at first. Look at earlobes, look at earrings. The second thing, or third, eyebrows. And AI's gotten better with the eyebrows. But sometimes you'll see a lady that has a very like defined eyebrow, and then over here it goes straight. Now, I don't know about you, but I want both of my eyebrows to look the same. But there are little indicators. And then for men, which is really weird because I haven't seen it that much on women, but I see it on men more often, is you'll see pixelation of their hair right around here and then by their, by right here. And you'll see these little bitty fine dots. And so I see that more so again in men, but I don't know why more so with women. The thing that I do notice on women, and you'll notice this too, you guys, if you're looking, is if you're trying to determine if it's an AI again, if I have long hair, right, on both sides. Most of the time, again, women like to have the same, you know, style on both sides. But I have a friend of mine that has long hair and then it's shepherd on this side. Again, it's, there are factors. But look at that AI because you might see something that has very long, you know, straight gear over here. And all of a sudden it's kinky curly over here. Again, that could be an indicator of an AI imagery. Um, one thing that I would always say is I always run my photographs through a facial recognition system too, and or an image recognition, which I really like TenEye for image recognition because it's looking at the image in a whole. I use a program called Pim Eyes, P-I-M-E-Y-E-S. It's a paid program, but it has, it's, I always talk about in my trainings, it's like the onion, right? And you have layers to an onion. And I always say, everybody has to remember what movie that came from because it's Shrek. I love that movie. And so you have that outer onion, which is normally like your social media profiles. But then the inner onion becomes more of different websites. It could be PDFs. It could be whatever, right? Somebody else posting that picture of them. And so I really like PMIs because it goes through the whole multiple layers of things. But on the imagery of AI, it is becoming better and it's learning um, from its mistakes. And what you'll see a lot of is they're starting to do more sideway views, right? So you don't get that ability to look at two ears. Imagery. And then the other thing with AI imagery is it used to be mostly predominantly you would get the face. You would just get the headshot. Now we have the ability to take that headshot, an AI created headshot, and now create multiple bodies for it, multiple things. Put them on the back of a truck drinking a Coke, walking down an alley with a coffee in their hand, looking out at the sunset. And so there are a couple ones out there um, that people have obviously heard of, Mid Journey. But there's one that I really like called Starry AI. And it allows not only for imagery of realistically looking pictures, but it also it gives you the ability to create old time, the black and whites. It allow you to take almost like pictures that look like paintings. People take their face and then it makes it look like a painting. Stuff like that. But there's generated dot photos, again, that will create AI created photographs and then allow you to create body, you know, to that photograph, that head. It's becoming, you know, more where you can really put together an entire figure. And then again, we all obviously know the deep face, taking somebody's face and putting on something else that happened. But that witchfaceisreal.com, you should actually go to it. It's actually very fun to play. I know one, two, the two places that I always look is the corner of the eye, because yeah. even if you had a bunch of Botox, it's really hard to get both eyes the same on the corners because most people aren't the same, even with a lot of Botox, in the corners of your mouth because you always smile slightly off because your face is not symmetric. It's asymmetric. So th those are the two things that I always take a look at. But I'm going to check out the ears because I usually yeah, don't pay attention thing, to the ears. Yeah, and perfect example of it is glasses. The glasses mm -hmm. should have the same reflection on both sides. So always look at the glasses too. 
We do a lot of things on our phone, and I want to be miss asking about our phone. What do you think people should do more proactively to protect themselves on their personal phone and, and also on their work phone? Okay. My answer to this, stop downloading phone. all these applications. Oh, my gosh. First of all, read the permissible purposes, because a lot of people don't even do that. And do I always think that all the permissible purposes are within the application that it's putting out there? No, I don't, because it depends also on who the developer and what country it's coming from. Or incognito. Right? Exactly. And so my big thing is, again, I always say very, be very careful with what you're putting on your phone, um, you know, for applications. I'm anti-application and not because I don't like applications, just because I just want my phone to be as secure as possible. Second is always look not only at the applications that are going on your phone, but constantly when your, your phone's being updated, um, you need to go back in through all of your privacy settings and look at what's being added and what, you know, has changed back or defaulted back. And I know that Apple had a big update. And one of the things that went viral and everybody was talking about was the journaling, right? And how you should go in there and, and, and disable that. So it's not just the applications that we have to, you know, mind. We also, every time there's an, an update, I go back through the privacy settings and I make sure that they're to where I want them to be. If there's something that shows up and I don't understand it, I Google it. What does this have to do with my phone? If I disengage it, what is it going to do to my phone? So people need to be very proactive, not only, again, on the application, but also be proactive by looking in your settings. And if you don't understand what it is, Google it, figure it out, find out what it does to your phone. And if you disengage it, if it's going to affect it negatively. But one of the things that me and you've talked about in the past, when it comes into these applications, a lot of it has locational purposing, right? Like a location uh, information. And the thing that I always say is where that, where's that information going? And they can say all day long, they're not selling our information. There's a ton of sites that share information. There's a ton of, of applications that share app, uh, information that they pull with other applications. So you have to really look at not only the application you're, you're putting on your phone, but who is it sharing your information with? And there's a grocery store app, and I don't want to say the grocery store. Um, you guys can Google it, and you can figure it out. There's a, an article about it. But it talks about how when you purchase things from this particular grocery store, and especially within the app, it shares that information, not only with Facebook, but with Google, with Pinterest, and with Snapchat. So what you're purchasing at the grocery store doesn't stay within your app. It's now being shared with other avenues to ever, and, and it becomes part of that advertising identification number thing and becomes direct marketable data. So there's a whole thing behind all these apps. And so you got to be really careful with it. Oh my God, I could talk about apps all day long, but you just be very careful with what you put on your phone. I think it's a really good point that if you're going to upgrade, take a look. And, it, and if the developer just says, yeah. I'm not going to tell you what I'm changing. I'm like, I ain't changing it. They do that consistently. There's a different application who's going to be more transparent in what they're doing from security and privacy perspective. You need an app. Look at those ones. It may cost you something. It may not cost you something. I say there's no free lunch. As you said, behind the scenes, if there's a free lunch, theoretically, it means that they're just selling yeah. your data behind your back and they're making money off it. So, 100%. so sometimes paying for something is a little better control. But I, yeah. if not, use, use another agree. app as well, too. If you're not using them, turn them off. Have something behind, behind you, watch you. But what I mean by watch is saying you haven't used this app in a month. You haven't used it in two weeks. Do you still need it? And if you don't need it, get rid of it. But you can always put it back if you do need it at a future time. This right. can be unrealistic, too. But I also say if you have the capability of having more than one phone. Right. So you have a phone that you want to make absolutely secure, especially for, you know, work environment situations. And then you have a second phone that you don't care maybe it's so much and you do have some more applications on that. But we have to be very careful with that, too, is because a lot of people use their personal phones for their work. And I always say that's to me, it's a fine line that you got to draw. It depends, on, again, on what you're worried about. And if you don't have that job or you're worried about different type of information being leaked out but having more than one phone is another option 
I did that with a tablet when we when I travel yeah. to conferences and speaking, and it's under a bogus name, a bogus email, throw away email address and all that. And then if somebody actually gets it, so what you knew of something I might have been reading on a download, and then I reset it all the time, factory yeah, reset. Me too. Every yeah. time. So you can do yeah. things like that. But you, I think the key point here is you have to be the one who takes the ownership of protecting you. Don't be naive enough thinking a corporation out there is going to take that upon themselves to do that. I agree. I really do. Unfortunately, our time has totally flown by. So I want to thank oh everybody for, for joining us for this session. Um, please go ahead and look at the descriptions. We will have the links. We will go ahead and I'll put the links down there on the application that Michelle has recommended. And she'll give me some other ones to put down there as well, too. Her contact information will be there as well. Please go ahead and, and subscribe. The newsletter, Soulful CXO Insights newsletter, come out every other week. Remember, I do at least one article every other week as well, too. So please go ahead and look at that. Michelle, thank you so much for coming on again and sharing your insights. You're always a pleasure to have on. Thank you. I appreciate that.